Well, recently I've been away and I've been in the UK for four weeks with my family and mother-in-law. And we've been travelling around the south of the UK, spent a few, UK, a few days in London, spent a couple of weeks in Scotland. It was an amazing trip. Uh, we took the direct flight from Perth to London, which is 17 hours of sitting in a rather uncomfortable chair. As a cyclist, I'm used to uncomfortable seats uh, on my bike, but that was a new level for me of discomfort, and uh, 17 hours is a long time to be sitting, and given my height, also rather squished together. I don't know if you've ever travelled on a plane and you, you have moments of existential crisis where, like me, uh, on the flight, I kind of sat there and thought, hmm, I feel like I'm just floating in the air in this tin can. I don't have any control over where I'm going. I trust the pilot's got that under control at the front. What can I do about this? I'm kind of stuck. I don't have control. Now, as we talk about the concept of suffering, I think that that's an issue for many when it comes to suffering. It's often we don't have control of our situation. And I think that's a real element of suffering. But the one thing that I thought about when it comes to suffering was the picture of being on a plane and, and looking down at the, the world beneath you. And you have this grand picture. I've got a, I've got a reminder of us on the, on the screen here. You can see the desert. We've got the next slide there. Thank you. Uh, you've got a picture out of the plane window and you can see the desert. And that's kind of one way to look at suffering from like 40,000 feet up. And you have a big picture view of it. And you can talk about the issue of suffering from a philosophical point of view, and you can, you can consider all different angles and facets of it because you've got a grand view of it. But of course, the other element of suffering is actually living in it. Standing in the desert, it's not quite as fun. The heat, the pain, the suffering. And I imagine today there's people in both of these camps, some who are here and, and can engage with the big picture of, of why is there suffering and consider the philosophical issues around that but there's some of us here today that are probably stuck living in it. And I just want to acknowledge that. And I want to say that God is near to the brokenhearted. And this morning we're going to finish today with a time of prayer where we can stand together with those who are living in it. Suffering is hard. Today this question of suffering in the world is I think one of the most common questions that I've come across, as I said earlier. And perhaps one of the most common critiques about faith that we come across. It's been one that's been raised for thousands of years and the church has worked on this issue of how we might respond. I'm not here to give you any answers this morning. I want to give you some tools as to how you might respond to those around you who bring this question to you. Because I think if it hasn't come up, it probably will come up as people consider their own life and their own uh, journey of suffering in some way, shape, or form. So this question of, if God is good, why does he allow bad things to happen? Is something that a two or three, four-year-old can understand when they have significant loss in their life. It's not, a, it's not a complex question in that sense. I think we can all ask it of any age. But the question kind of is supposed to have two answers. And I think I've, I've got the logical things on the screen which people will bring up as they talk about this issue. If God is good, why doesn't he deal with suffering? Well, the first reason is, well, God isn't all-powerful. He can't deal with suffering. That's why we have it. He can't end suffering. And if he can't end suffering, then he's not really God. He's not all-powerful. So people might come up with that answer. Or the second one, the second answer they might come up, a solution to this question could be, well, he chooses not to which means he's not good. He doesn't care about it. He's not a good God. And of course, both these solutions have issues for people of faith. They have issues, don't they? They have problems. Either God isn't all powerful or he's not all good and loving. If he was, either of those two things, he would deal with suffering. Of course, this question assumes something, doesn't it? It assumes that suffering, all suffering is bad and that if God was good and loving, he'd deal with suffering and he'd remove it from our lives. It seems like a, a lose-lose situation. When you're faced with this question, you're talking to someone, you feel like backed into a corner. about you, but I can feel backed into a corner. What do I do? I can't choose either of these options. This is what we call the fool's choice, where both choices are bad. 
But I want to help you think about this. Because I think there's other ways we can respond by going, instead of going down these logical conclusions that I've placed up here. Of course, the assumption is, I've put there, that all suffering is bad. But if we think about that a little bit more, and we try and help people to stop and think about this question. I mean, you could talk about the Olympics. Has anyone been watching the Olympics? There's a few of you. Great. So the Olympics is on at the moment, for those of you living under a rock, and uh, in Paris, and I've been watching a little bit of it here and there. Uh, but we understand, with any competition, there's a level of training, there's a level of suffering that we see in the competition, and of course there's a whole bunch we don't see, all the training that goes on behind. Thousands of hours, often, put into training our bodies, enduring pain, teaching it to endure pain. Um, as a cyclist in, in, in the sport of my choice, uh, you have to teach your body to process the lactic acid that builds up in your body, the pain kind of you feel, the burning pain that you feel after exercise when your muscles are full of lactic acid. You've got to teach and train your body to deal with that. That's a level of suffering in and of itself. And so when we think about sports, we understand that there's some good suffering there. It has a purpose. And so this assumption that all suffering is bad, uh, that's not entirely true, is it? Uh, interestingly, though, you know, we know it from a deep, a deep level, and this came out for me um, just recently in, in a meme that popped up, a guy called Yusef. Has anyone heard of Yusef, the shooter? Anyone, anyone seen this? So this guy, he, he decided to take up shooting as a stress relief in his life due to some uh, stress and pain that he was experiencing. And um, he came to the Olympics. He says he's a natural shooter, so he just comes up, hand in the pocket, shoots, a, shoots at the target, wins a silver medal. He's the most casual Olympian that you could see. And uh, there's a few memes going around about him. I think even one of the, another athlete even copied his stance on victory just because it was quite iconic at the time. But of course, then you've got all the other shooters, like this lady from the 90s Matrix uh, world, dressed up with all her like targeting equipment, got all the right gear on. Uh, and then there's Yusuf, who just seems to casually walk up, not really, doesn't seem to be trying, and just wins. Or receives silver, which better than what I could do, that's for sure. Uh, but there's this thing here that captured people's attention because it's like he can just casually do it. There's no effort, there's no straining, there's no struggle required. I think deep down that captured something of our society. We, we wish life would be like this, yet we know it isn't. So when we see a glimpse of this, we take hold of it and it captures our attention. We long for life to be easy. We know, though, some struggle is good. Of course, struggle in the sense of sport has a purpose. Uh, there's other struggles like sitting in the front row of church. That's another level of struggle. I can tell you that the front row of church, there's no distractions. You can have a clear view of what's happening. Um, my kids learnt another form of struggle this morning. I brought them along for the first service. They sat through me uh, preaching and uh, that was a struggle for them this morning. There's, there's lots of different sorts of struggles. Some have short term, some are longer term, some are medium term. Some have a purpose that's clearly identified as well, like these athletes. But there's a whole lot of struggle that doesn't seem to have a purpose, isn't there? And I think that's what we really wrestle with. Struggle that doesn't, and pain that doesn't seem to have a purpose that we can see. No visible, apparent purpose. And we ask this question, why would a loving God allow such things to those he loves? We see in our reading today that, that Jesus actually responds to the, to the pain and the suffering and the struggle of Mary and Martha and to Lazarus as well. We see in verse 4 that when Jesus heard about this, he, he actually says, well, Lazarus' sickness won't end in death. No, it actually happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will be revealed and glory will be given to him from this. So Jesus actually, I mean, we might look at Lazarus' struggles and suffering from our point of view, but straight away, Jesus, the fullness of God, God in human form, sees a different purpose in his struggle. He sees purpose in something that we wouldn't normally see purpose in. That makes me stop and think about suffering and about our limited human perspective on suffering. It's easy to jump towards conclusions, but we see here that Jesus actually sees, saw a clear purpose in this suffering to bring people to Jesus, 
to see, help see Jesus for who he really is. God might actually know the purpose behind our suffering that we go through too. That gives us a glimmer of hope when it comes to struggling with suffering. There might actually be a purpose that we are yet to see. And I think for some, for much suffering in the world, we might not see the purpose till we reach heaven, till we can talk with Jesus and see his perspective on our suffering, just like he saw perspective on Lazarus' suffering. That makes us stop and think, hang on, maybe, I'm, maybe I, I need to wait before I cast judgment on my suffering. Perhaps there is hope that there is a purpose and that Jesus knows that purpose. Another assumption that we might have about suffering is that it's actually God's problem. And the question I pose and the solutions that I've, that I've mentioned seem to put the onus on God to end suffering, that if he is loving and all good and all powerful, then it's, it's his job to end suffering in the world. I mean, we know from our perspective, humanly possible, we can't end suffering in the world. We can try, we can, we can in, invent technology that helps, but we can't end suffering. But it's easy to put the emphasis on, well, it's God's job to fix it. But is it God's job to fix it? Is it his responsibility? The Bible actually points us to sin as the cause of suffering. It's the root problem and the root cause of suffering It's not God. He is not responsible for suffering in the world. Paul says to the church in Rome, he says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. The Adam we're talking about here is mentioned in Genesis. And in Genesis 3, we see Adam and Eve taking the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that, they sin. They sin. Go against God's commands, his instructions. Now, they had been given freedom over everything in the garden. Freedom to walk with God, to worship him. Yet they chose not to do those things. They chose to eat this fruit and do the one thing they were were given not to. And when they experienced the consequence of that, separation from God, they hide from God initially in their shame, but they also brought out of that garden, out of that, that space with God, separated from their, from their God through their own actions, through their own sin. And as Paul says here, sin has infected everything, infected the world. Our creation is broken. Our experience of that is broken because of sin. We experience the brokenness of the world through our own heart and our own sinful hearts that make choices that aren't wise. And we we reap the benefits of those unwise choices in our own life. Uh, we also experience that from others who make bad choices. We experience brokenness through that as well, through other people's bad choices. And we experience in our bodies that death and decay is a part of our existence because of sin. Suffering is a part of us because of sin in the world. And it's not God that has caused this. This is the problem of sin working in our hearts and in the world that causes suffering. So we should be angry at, at sin, not at God for brokenness and suffering. So we can respond to these questions about suffering to those that might ask or those that might present this issue. And we can help them to stop and think about this on a, on a deeper level. Rather than rushing to some conclusions that ultimately mean they will discredit God and choose not to believe him. We can help them to stop and think and journey with them in responding to questions about suffering. I've never seen someone that I've had a conversation with choose to follow Jesus based on losing an argument either. So our posture in talking about this needs to be humble. It needs to take someone on a journey of relationship with them. Now, as we talk about these things, these issues of suffering from a high level, of the plane looking down, I now want to talk a little bit more about living with suffering and and provide some encouragement. If you aren't going through a time of suffering now, chances are you will do. It's part of our human existence because of sin. If you are going through a time of suffering at the moment, I want to give you some encouragement, some things you can take away with. Now, because suffering comes from sin, 
Satan uses sin to tempt us, to walk away from God. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden walked away and hid themselves from God. So in suffering, we too can be tempted to withdraw from God. We can be tempted to think God doesn't care about us because we are suffering. We see in response to Lazarus and Mary and Martha suffering, Jesus doesn't withhold himself. Now, he might delay himself because he's got a bigger perspective on Lazarus' suffering, but he doesn't withhold, he doesn't stand back. That's not the picture of God we get here. The picture of God we see in Jesus is that he actually goes to them. He goes to them. Jesus goes to Mary and Martha and he comforts them. He is with them in their grief and in their suffering. Satan might tempt us to think God doesn't care, but it's not the picture of Jesus we have here. We see Jesus going to his friends and this grief overwhelms him. He weeps tears with Mary and Martha, with those who are grieving. This is not a God who is removed from the world. This is a God who wants to be with the world in its suffering. He wants to be with us, with you, as you suffer, as you grieve. He's moved to tears of weeping. Jesus cares about your suffering. Cling to the, and cling to the hope that he will be with you through it. Psalm 34 says that God is close to the brokenhearted. Jesus is the fulfillment of this. He is the fullness of God in human form. So he comes and he is with those who are brokenhearted. He is with Mary and Martha. He weeps with them. Now in our suffering, we might be tempted to isolate ourselves and pull ourselves back from others. Uh, This is, I think, a temptation for all of us. We might start to think, well, no one gets me. No one understands the pain I'm going through. So I'm not going to reach out. I'm I'm just going to withdraw. I'm going to withdraw myself. Adam and Eve did that in the garden. They withdrew themselves from God. They hid in their nakedness, in their sin. And we might be tempted to do the same thing. It's interesting in this account, as Jesus comes to Bethany and uh, Martha runs out to to see him. And uh, she expresses, um, you know, that question, you know, why are you letting bad things happen, Jesus? You're a good person, we know who you are. And then she expresses some hope as well in verse 22. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So in her grief, she's able to see that, well, in Jesus, there's still hope. But Mary doesn't run to Jesus when he first enters. For whatever reason, she, she doesn't go to him. Even though she was with Martha, she, she stays behind. That could be because she's a good host. So she's hosting those who have come in uh, from other towns, from Jerusalem, to grieve and mourn with her, as, as was a custom of the day. Maybe she's withdrawing herself. Maybe she, she doesn't want to be near Jesus. She's, maybe she's angry with Jesus. We don't actually know. The text doesn't say. What we do know is that as Martha comes back, she says, Jesus wants to see you. Jesus wants to see you, Mary. Mary hadn't gone, but Jesus here wants to be with the one that didn't go. The one that perhaps, perhaps wasn't feeling as good. In, in her grief. So in that moment, hearing that Jesus wants to see her, she too runs to go see Jesus and she expresses the same question at Martha, why didn't you come earlier? Why did you let this happen? Yet the text doesn't say that she expressed any more belief or hope in Jesus. Perhaps she was struggling with her grief more than what Martha was. But we see in this, Jesus asks for her. He wants to see her too. The temptation is to think that God doesn't want to be with me. He doesn't care. And we isolate, we withdraw ourselves from him. We become angry. And we also withdraw ourselves from community, from each other. But I want to encourage you, if you're struggling, you actually need other people to help you, to stand with you. So don't fall into Satan's trap of isolating yourself, where he can... He can weave anger into your heart that turns to bitterness, that turns to bitterness against God. Because Jesus wants to see you too. Even in your suffering, even in your pain. 
Now, the third temptation that I want to talk about today is, is the temptation that we might have in our suffering to want to go back to when things were better. I don't know if you've been tempted to think that, but it's easy to think that in our suffering, that I just wish I could go back. I wish I could bring that back. I wish I could take back that circumstance that's happened to me and go back to when things were better. The people of God did in the desert, the Israelites in the wilderness. God had freed them and pulled them out of Egypt and he was taking them through the desert and in the desert, the people of God, in their suffering, in their heat, in their hunger, they complained. They were being led by a guy, Moses, who they weren't really sure what he was doing and they complained. They wanted to be back in Egypt. At least they had better food back in Egypt Sure, the food was great, but it's a place of their suffering. It was a place of their slavery. It's tempting to want to be back, to go back, to long for the past. As followers of Jesus, we can be tempted that, to think that, well, I wish God would just take us back to the Garden of Eden, where things were great. Adam and Eve had it great. They walked with God. But there's a problem with that. And the problem is, what do we do with our existence here on earth? If God is going to take us back to that point, why does he let us go through this? If he's just going to take us back to Eden? Well, the thing about Eden is, while it was good, it wasn't best. It wasn't best. It might have been good, it might have been perfect. But there was no need for a saviour in Eden. In fact, the Bible points us to the trajectory that God will take you through your suffering to something even better than Eden. And we see that in Revelation. The picture we get in Revelation is one that we will be with God, new bodies, praising Him with the millions of others, all the believers together, praising Him. And we will see the Son of God, the Lamb that was slain, seated on the right hand of the Father. That is not a picture you see in Eden. That's a picture of journey through suffering. And of course, Jesus embodies that Himself, doesn't He? comes to earth, he suffers, he gives up his life to deal with the root cause of suffering, sin, to bring us back into relationship with God. Sure, we still live with the consequences of sin, but he has dealt with the root cause. And God wants to bring you through your suffering. He doesn't want to take you back. He wants to take you through your suffering to something even better. Satan will try and tempt you to go to long for what's before rather than moving forward, rather than to trust God that here's something better in store for you. He wants you to long to be back. But by faith, we can hold on to that future hope that God has got something better for us. Peter says to the church of Rome, he, he says, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the la- on the last day for all to see. So truly be glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Now, if anyone could say this, I think Peter could say it. Oh, we know from tradition that Peter was crucified. Some say crucified upside down even for his faith. He suffered many trials. And he just tacks that on to the end. Endure many trials for a little while, he says. He's got a perspective so much bigger. A perspective that there is something better to come. The picture of heaven. And it is through faith that we hold on to that. Until it is ready to be revealed on the last day, our salvation. So there is hope in suffering. Not that God will take us back, but he will bring us through it. That he is with us in it and that there is something better to come. Sometimes we see that here on earth. Sometimes we see that better place here on earth. Sometimes we don't until eternity. But there is hope today, because Jesus is with us. Now, as I was thinking about this this topic, um, one of the things that came to mind was a man called Horatio Spafford. Now, He is someone who shows us that there's hope today as we follow Jesus. Now, Horatio Spafford lived in the 1800s and uh, 
he, was, he invested heavily in property. He lived in Chicago, heavily invested in property. Unfortunately, in the Chicago fire of 1871, he lost pretty much everything, his fortune. I mean, the whole city was burnt down. It was tragic. Not long after this, one of his children passed away from scarlet fever. And uh, I guess feeling pretty worn out and weary, him and his wife decided to go on holiday over to England. And I think probably due to uh, business dealings around his properties that burnt down, he couldn't travel with his family. Something happened last minute. So he sent his family ahead across to England via boat. And uh, him, uh, his wife, Anna, and their four daughters on the boat. Uh, unfortunately, the boat was hit by another. There was a collision as they travelled across. And the boat sunk within four minutes. It was 200 plus people passed away on that boat, including... Uh, Anna and Horatio's four daughters on the boat, who all passed away. And Horatio received a telegram from his wife when she arrived in England saying, saved alone. Saved alone. Horatio rushes to be with his wife, takes the next boat across to be with his wife in her grieving. And um, as he was approaching the area, uh, where the boat went down. He asked the captain to tell him uh, when they got above the waters of where the boat sunk. And as he was informed that they were travelling over the, the place where his daughter sunk, he went down to his cabin and, and he penned these words in a poem, It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It's a, it's a famous hymn. It was turned into a hymn that the church has been singing ever since. In Horatio's greatest point of pain, he still experienced hope. Now, see, Horatio understood something about grief here. See, grief and suffering may take those around you. It may take your health. It may take your mind. But it can't take your soul. Your soul is eternal, given to you by God. It may take everything else but it can't take your soul. And so Horatio can say these words because of his faith in Jesus, that it is well with our soul. Through faith, we hold on to the promise of what is to come, that there is something better, that Jesus will give us a new body, that one day we will celebrate in heaven, having gone through suffering with our Saviour. Now, the story doesn't finish there because Horatio and his wife, together, ended up having some more children and through with some friends who surrounded and supported them, they travelled to Jerusalem uh, and uh, in Palestine, as it was called then, uh, they decided to open up their house to minister to others in need. You might think, he's suffered so much. He's lost everything financially, lost family. Yet in this place of need... Him and his wife and, and their friends just served the community. Those around them, Muslims and Jews at the time, everyone was welcome. They fed them, they cared for them, particularly orphans and children in that community. Now, his, his daughter actually launched uh, the Spafford Children's Centre in Jerusalem. So they had some more kids and one of his daughters uh, launched the centre, which still exists today, the Spafford Children's Centre, and it actually still operates. Its headquarters is still in uh, the house they ministered out of uh, back then. What a legacy. A legacy of hope, even amongst grief and suffering and loss. Because Horatio understood that it is well with our soul. Perhaps today you're suffering. Perhaps you're in a place of suffering today. I want to encourage you to hold on to the faith that you have in Jesus, that He is with you in your suffering, that He weeps with you. He calls to you, I am here. I want to be with you. Don't pull yourself away from me. And there are those of us around that want to stand with you in your trials, in your grief, 